So last time uh, we stopped that uh, we wanted to discuss uh, Maxwell equations as we as we have our fields in some medium, not not just in in empty in the vacuum. Okay, and uh, as I said, uh, then you have to worry because the presence uh, of an electric and magnetic field itself modifies the, the, the atoms, uh, whatever the medium is made of, uh, producing, uh, think of electrons or some atomic uh, structures, producing uh, some ad additional electric and magnetic fields, right? I mean, you modify the structure of, uh, of, uh, of this table and, uh, and there is a back reaction due to the... Uh, uh, atomic structure uh, uh, of the table itself, so you have to worry about when you when when we wrote uh, Maxwell equations and we wrote the, the the charges and the currents, what those charges and currents are exactly, right? Uh, you really want to only worry about external charges that you put in the system or external currents, and not the uh, many extra charges and currents that are due to the fact that you are stressing the, the medium through the presence of these fields. So one way to, to well, this problem has been handled by, so, so for first you split your currents, right, in, in the Maxwell equation into uh, uh, what, uh, what is the real current, that is a current that you put from outside, plus uh, the contribution to, to the current that is induced Okay, as I said, by, by the presence of the fields themselves. Okay, and the same you do with the, with the, uh, with your charges, charge density, current density. You write uh, an external part plus a, a, a induced one. Okay, is is this uh, is this clear? Is the problem clear or? You just want me to finish, then go on <laughs> to a next object. I, you see the problem. You, you have an electric field, or uh, a, 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 as the, this field goes through uh, this table, the atomic structure is, uh, is, is changed, right? They move, for instance. Uh, for, for instance, you start having electrons going up and down, and themselves, they, they then produce an electric and a magnetic field. And so you have sort of, you induce new currents and new charges by putting uh, that table into an electric and magnetic field. So let's split what we put uh, in the Maxwell equation with the density of current and density of charge, charges uh, 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 in these two components, okay? So this is, is really the external one and this is the, the induced one. And what is the... Uh, this part here then uh, is usually written in this form, and uh, you will see why in a second. So the induced current comes from two contributions. Uh, one is the, you understand, the polarization of your medium, and it goes, so the, the medium is polarized by the external fields, and the time variation of this polarization, the time variation of this polarization induces a, a current. So you have a term that goes as a time variation of this. So this is called the polarization. Okay. And, and also you have, a, a, so this, this, if you wish, is the electric part. But you also have a magnetization of your medium. Okay. And the curve of this magnetization is producing a current. Remember your Maxwell equation. By, by now, I hope you, you know them by, by heart. And so the curve, the curve of this, uh, so this is the magnetization. Okay. So you have two uh, new vectors, if you wish. One is the polarization of your medium. All your atoms are sort of uh, deform and align. This is the polarization. And also you have a sort of magnetization, so some, some, uh, uh, and uh, through Maxwell equation, you know that it is the time variation of this that is inducing a current and the curl of this producing a, 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 a induced current. How about the, 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 
the, the charge density. The charge density, again, uh, uh, if you have polarization of your medium, remember your Maxwell equation, then the divergence of this polarization is going to be linked through Gauss law to, 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 to some charge density. And so uh, it, it's put uh, with the minus sign, and, and you have this term. Okay, so the polarization is here and there, and then you have a term that comes from, uh, uh, you, you don't have any magnetic contribution here, obviously, because uh, that's the electric charge, so it does not. Uh, okay, so it's kind of nice. Uh, 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 it it formalizes this uh, uh, effect of induce, inducing a, a, an electric uh, current and charge densities uh, through the, uh, the effect of polarizing your medium uh, and also magnetizing the medium. So if I take these two expressions then, okay, you see I can, I can replace my induced de uh, current density and, and, and charge densities by these two expressions. So instead of having this vector and scalar uh, that I don't know what it is, I replace it with other two vectors that I don't know what they are that is the polarization, the magnetization, and then I can plug these into, the, into my Maxwell equations. Remember, Maxwell equations, I guess, uh, in these units are uh, this rho epsilon naught. Let me just rewrite for you. And then I have the curls, right, minus d, d, p, b, and then the, the, the one that is So mu naught j plus this 1 over c square uh, d e d t. So you see, if now I, rep I, I, sh I, I should replace this uh, rho and this j by this, what I wrote here. So from the first one, I get, uh, uh, right, I... So I get D E. Uh, let, let's write it this for. So uh, I have one over epsilon naught. Then rho is really this plus this. Okay, so I have rho external plus uh, the induced charge density. That, however, I want to write like uh, the divergence of this uh, polarization vector. Okay, so this was for the first one. Uh, I don't. Uh, <coughs> hmm? Now this one, uh, it's okay because there is no uh, charge. There is no neither charge or uh, or uh, current. So that this one stays the way it is. Uh, uh, however, the this other one here. Uh, Again, uh, is the same, right? Uh, so these two, I, these two are the, the two nice uh, Maxwell equations because they don't have any external charge and uh, current. Mm -hmm. So these two, they, st they stay the way they, they are. They stand correct. Uh, I have to rewrite the other one, right? The curl of B, right? And uh, so this is mu naught. Uh, and then I replace uh, this uh, J that I have here with this. Uh, so I have my J, the external current densities. But now I want again to, to uh, replace uh, this induced one by this polarization and magnetization vectors. So I get these two extra pieces that I wrote there, dT P plus the curl of the magnetization. Okay, And then I still have... Uh, dt. And uh, now I sort of, uh, I, I, I do the usual uh, massage. So because you see that the nice thing is that uh, the polarization, of course, uh, it was defined such a way that this comes naturally on the other side. So I can rewrite this pair of equations in, in a more suggestive way. That is, if I write divergence of Maybe I put, uh, 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 right, I have uh, 
maybe it's nicer to, to multiply everything by epsilon naught. Uh, so I think I wrote it like this, plus p equal to rho, right? Uh, you just, uh, and the other one, uh, I take the curl, but is the curl of what? I have the curl of this b, right? Uh, let's say write it this way. I take uh, the mu naught, I take it on the other side. So I have the curl here, then I have a curl of m, so, but it comes with the plus. I take it on the other side, I get minus this magnetization. And, and, and this quantity is equal to, to this. Uh, so I, the mu naught, I took, I took it on the other side. So here again, I just have the external uh, current density plus uh, the terms that uh, uh, comes with the, the time derivatives of the electric field. So, okay. And uh, at this point, as usual, uh, you, uh, uh, so you see now the, the quantities appearing, uh, uh, you know, the same way that we had uh, the electric field and the magnetic field in our original uh, Maxwell equations uh, in the vacuum. So these are in vacuum. Or these are called microscopical. Microscopic. Okay, those are microscopic, as I said last time, microscopic Maxwell equations. This, this here, I can give a name to this quantity because you see that it, it is this quantity is rather than just the, the electric field that appears everywhere. So I may as well give a name to this, and it's called D. Don't ask me why D, but yeah. Uh, uh, louder, I can. Polarization. Ah, uh, yeah, I forgot. Uh, you're absolutely right. I, I, I still have to collect. Otherwise, this trick wouldn't work. Uh, I have P plus epsilon dot e, right? Uh, I'll come, because uh, there is a, okay. Remember that uh, one over c square, right, is, uh, uh, 1 over c is 1 over the square root of uh, epsilon naught mu naught, so you can. Uh, I'll come back to this in a second. So thank you. In fact, otherwise it, it won't work so well. So And here I have the again, right? And this, this combination is called H. That is the, uh, this new uh, magnetic field. So in other words, I can write uh, uh, exactly like, uh, so I can write a new set of, uh, of Maxwell uh, equations. Okay, these two, <coughs> uh, uh, we still say, th this two is just divergence. So I, I, I replace E by D, and, and, and in a way, I have exactly the same equation, except that instead of having this microscopic charge density, I have the external charge density. So really the charges that I'm putting into the system, an electron or something, and, and I put this electron inside this table, okay, and this is the correct equation. And similarly, uh, uh, this one is replaced by this uh, nice combination. So these are, uh, are uh, uh, in a medium or micro Maxwell equations. So usually in the, in the textbooks you, you will see these because uh, these are the, 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 the ones that are correct. But then uh, you have to explain what these fields are. In fact, they even have uh, a name. So let's, let's uh, uh, dwell for, for just uh, for a few seconds more on these questions. Uh, 
So this is the polarization, magnetization, and uh, uh, do, do I have a C square there? I'm not sure. I think, uh, I mean, uh, you don't have this C square, right? It's like this. Okay. So they, as I said, they even so this D field is uh, called the electric displacement. I mean, it's not important. I just give you these names because otherwise you you go and read the book or, or something and, and then you don't know what they are talking about. We, we want the, uh, this H is what is called the magnetic field. Yes? Well, I erase one of the C square, but uh, in the process I also erase the, the plus. That's, uh, I don't know. I don't know. But you see, I, I, I sort of led you astray because I was calling B the magnetic field, but really what people call the magnetic field is this H. And so how do you call B? I, this is called the magnetic induction. And E is the electric field. So in this language, uh, this is E is the electric field, H is the magnetic field. The other two are sort of electric displacement and magnetic induction. But I, I don't know. The way I studied when I was young it was, uh, I guess I was in the vacuum. So I always, so I always thought that. Uh, so I keep on calling that the magnetic field, but I guess uh, you, you must know <laughs> that this is. W w for us, it's not very, uh, I'm not going, so it depends on what you do afterward. Of course, it's if you work in solid state physics or, or something that really has to do with, uh, with matter, uh, then uh, you better remember this set of Maxwell equations. But if you then go on in doing high energy physics, then, uh, uh, essentially, you are in a vacuum because uh, very, you know, when uh, when you go to very short distances, then the, the 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 macroscopic structure of matter doesn't matter any longer. So really, you you think of these equations. But okay, the important thing is this, uh, because sometimes this is very confusing. Uh, confusing. I mean, you you have all this B H. Uh, uh, I think this explains what uh, I, I hope so. I, I hope. To have explained for you, yes, this. Yes, I think the, the other equation is not so in divergence of B because B is also equal to divergence of H. Yeah, yes. Then you, rep uh, you I think you can replace. Uh, 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 yeah, okay, but then you can replace everything with the D and H. You do no, but I think you should keep uh, this because that, that's the, what is really. I mean, the full set of Maxwell equations are uh, with D, H, E, and B. I mean, it's not that you. Uh, okay, it's a good point. It's not that uh, you know that's re that would be really that would be easy if if I just tell you replace E with D and uh, then okay. No, the real set is this one. But uh, so uh, let me just, so this is all I wanted to say. But uh, uh, actually, you see, the, the, this is a sort of simplification. 
because I, uh, well, now I raise it, but uh, I assume that uh, this was the end of the story. But actually, the story is more complicated because now you want to know clearly what is the relationship between. So let's write it in component. Uh, D, uh, for instance, the relationship between this electric displacement and the electric field. And the way I told you the story up to now is sort of a simplification because what I told you is that this is equal to epsilon zero. So the, the alpha component of the electric displacement will be just epsilon naught, the alpha component of the electric field. And the only difference is that you have to add a component of this uh, uh, polarization. But of course, this is a sort of a, a simplification because it's assuming that if you have some atomic structure, you apply an electric field, right? And then the only effect is this polarization. But really, you can have more complicated things because you see this is a sort of a linear response. But of course, uh, uh, the story is always more complicated. So you can think that you have higher order terms with some tensorial, for instance, this is a, what is this polarization? We will study this problem. This is what is called the electric dipole. That is, the, is the, the field generated by two charges of opposite sign very close to each other. This is the first effect, right? The atom uh, starts out to be um, neutral. Then you, you pull a little bit away the electrons from the, from the proton. I mean, this is a cartoon. I mean, clearly, it's more complicated. But at this point, if you are here, you start what was neutral is not neutral any longer because you know, it's not the sphere screening completely the protons. So this, this is this term. But the, the story is more complicated because actually you, you have a distortion that is not just this pulling apart. So you have the next term that is called the quadrupole. That is a tensor, obviously, because life is like this. And it goes like a derivative of the quadrupole, I don't know, something like this. And, and so on and so forth. So this is usually the dipole term. This is the quadrupole term. Actually, uh, very shortly, we will see that any charge distribution can be expanded. The potential of any charge distribution can be expanded in terms like this. You have the monopole, the dipole, the quadrupole, like a, a gravitational field. I don't remember. Did we do that for, for the gravitational field? Maybe not. But uh, uh, this is, a, a, and so on and so forth, depending on the shape, right? Yes? That, that, no, there is no tripod. Yeah. Why? Yeah. I knew that you wanted to know why. It's a question uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of symmetry, if you want. You, you cannot make this. Uh, it depends on the field. It depends on the field. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, you can do the same. I mean, this is, OK. It's still interesting. As I said, if you have a, a charge distribution, then you expand. Okay, and, and the expansion is you have a monopole, then you have the dipole. So what then is the quadrupole? There is no tripole or whatever you want to call it because uh, there is no way geometrically to produce this, uh, these terms. Also, you have a problem with the indices if you want to try that. But that the same is for the gravitational field. For instance, the, the gravitational field of the sun in our classical mechanics class, we always assume that it was like if you, as if you have taken all the mass of the sun and put it in one point, right? That was the potential. And, and this, is the, this term here is the monopole. But really, the sun is not a point. The sun is a sphere. Actually, it's not even quite a sphere, no? because it's a little bit squashed, because it, it's turning around. So you may wonder if there is a, a dipole contribution. Well, there, for instance, is a case in which you don't have the dipole. And you see why you don't have a dipole for the gravitational field. Because to have a dipole, you need a positive and a, a negative charge. Because what, what you're not, there is nothing to pull apart there. It's mass with the same sign. So the gravitational field has no dipole. So there is an example in which you have monopole. And then the first correction is a quadrupole. So it depends on the kind of field, what kind of terms you have there. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it, well, it's the symmetry 
uh, of the body, the shape of the body for the gravitational field, and also the fact whether it is uh, always uh, uh, attractive or it can have a positive and negative charge. At the quantum level, this is carry on through the fact that, uh, uh, you see, uh, if you have a, a positive and negative charges, then the field is a spin one uh, field, uh, uh, like the photon. So the, the, uh, and the, the graviton uh, uh, is always attractive because it's a spin two field, if you, if you, if you go on uh, or if you think about it. Well, you have to think very really hard <laughs> to, to get this, but uh, 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 the property of the quantum field uh, are, are a reflection of this very basic uh, property that we are studying here. So that's uh, everything is connected. Yeah. The graviton. The sun. No, the sun is not, no, the graviton is, okay, this is outside our, but no, the graviton is, is the, 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 what carries the interaction. Here, uh, it, it's an electric field, right? This is the interaction, a and is carried by the photons at the quantum level. Similarly, the gravitational interaction is carried by some field, the gravitational field, and that field at the quantum level is a spin two particle. The sun is the source, it's like the charge. The sun is the, sor the source, so it's like an electric charge. Then the electric charge produces a modification of space, time, actually, that is the interaction. The graviton is, uh, you, you have a field, the gravitational field. If you quantize that field, you have quanta. These quanta are the graviton. And what I said is that this quanta, right, is a, is a particle. It, it has spin two because it's always attractive. Or maybe one should say vice versa. Because it's spin two, it's always. <clears throat> this is the way Einstein discovered the theory. I mean, he first tried with a scalar, right? He said, okay, the, the interaction is carried by a scalar particle. It doesn't work. Then he ruled out the vector particles because he knew that if the carrier was a spin one, it would have mass and anti-mass. Uh, he knew that, that, so he ended up with a spin two. And unfortunately, spin two is a tensor field. So the theory of general relativity is the theory of a tensor field, not the vector field, like here. But that's, uh, okay. No, but it's important to, to know, you know, you have perspective. I think it's useful because otherwise you study only your thing, but they are all connected. You know, at the end you turn back and you see that they were all connected. So it's important to see also, to, to, to see this theory in the broader context. This is, after all, is just an example, particular example of a gauge theory, right? So you should see as a... So where were we... Uh, Ah, okay, uh, the, this question of the, so this is the electric displacement. So as I said, uh, even here, this already was ugly enough, right? Because, uh, but it's not the end of the story. So it's itself a simplification. And, and similarly, I must say that also this uh, magnetic field, H, each component, these are components, you have three components, right? Because they are vector in space, in space, in three dimensional space, uh, you see it's uh, one over uh, this B, then you have this magnetization, but again here then you have other terms, I, I'm not going to write them. So in general, you, you, uh, what, we, what I did here was to stop here, so this is sort of the linear, if you want, approximation or the lowest order approximation, but uh, uh, it, it, it could easily become uh, much more uh, complicated. And maybe the last thing one uh, you find in the book is that, in fact, if these corrections are small, meaning that you can keep essentially this first term, as I said, 
then you see that uh, you can, the D field roughly can be written. You see, that means if, if these are small, this essentially the D is almost proportional to the field, to the, to the E field. So you, you can introduce an epsilon without the knot E, right? Where this epsilon is this term here, something epsilon naught 1 plus k e. You see what I'm saying? If the polarization, uh, assume that the, 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 this, this correction is small, then you can think this polarization as essentially proportional itself to e. You apply the field and the, 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 the dipole that is induced itself is proportional to the field. It's not true, but it's an approximation. It's like the harmonic oscillator. And if this is true, also this is proportional to E, so I can write it as some new constant, E. And this new constant has this term, I guess here I should put the 1, plus some other co constant that take, takes into account the dipole terms. And this in the, so this in the books is called uh, the, the dielectric, the, the electric constant, the electric, the electric, maybe it, I can see it. The electric, there are too many something. There is no C, the electric. Okay? And it, it could be itself rather complicated. It could be a tensor, for instance. If, 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 if it's not just a component, but when you apply an electric field, you get also components in other directions. You understand, right? If, 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 if you apply perpendicularly, and then the only polar polarization is perpendicular, then uh, it, it's just a constant. But if by, by applying the field, you get also components in other directions, then this is a, co it's a tensor. But OK, it, it is what it is, and it's called the dielectric constant in the medium, right? This is in the vacuum. A and, uh, uh, a a and this part here is the, some other, cons the, this quantify the, the, the how proportional is this uh, polarization with respect to the external field. And similarly, for, for the magnetic field, I can do the, the same trick, right? I can uh, write it as a new constant mu rather than mu naught, and again, uh, uh, mu uh, uh, mu is equal to this mu naught one plus this. Uh, I think it's called susceptibility. What Su suscept some something? Okay, we we don't uh, suscept susceptibility. Anyway, you understand is the constant the proportionality of this term to to the external uh, b and e. Uh, no, it's called, I think, yes, and this is called the uh, permeability. Very good. Again, this in principle could be a tensor if you get components in other, in other directions. And I guess uh, uh, we can conclude. So I'm, ne I'm not going to talk about this any longer. I mean, we could spend a lot of time here. It depends on, the, on your approach on the subject. I mean, uh, uh, for us, this is enough. Uh, maybe just to, to suggest uh, further reading, uh, uh, clearly this permeability is linked with this very important distinction that uh, you know that uh, all materials can be either diamagnetic or paramagnetic. And this depends uh, on whether the ratio between this mu naught and mu is, is greater or, or, uh, or less than 1. So these are diagmagnetic, this, and these are paramagnetic. You know, everything is either diagmagnetic or paramagnetic. Actually, there is also something that is called ferromagnetics. This is even more interesting. Uh, uh, and uh, for, for those of you who will go on into solid state physics, that will become uh, clearly very important. So what is a ferromagnetic material? Well, that's essentially a material for which this M, the magnetization, is there no matter 
uh, I mean, you don't have to apply an external B field in order to induce this uh, M. It's already there because the, the, the atomic structure uh, is such that uh, it's already magnetized in a way, right? For instance, uh, uh, the, the, the magnets, the things we started with, uh, 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 they are magnets. So they have a, a M that is intrinsic to the material because uh, the, some electric currents going around producing a constant ferromagnetic uh, structure. And therefore, this, uh, even if you don't apply any external magnetic field, you do have a magnetic field because you have the non-vanishing M, okay? Those are very interesting materials, uh, very uh, important, and, uh, and they are what they are. <coughs> okay? So that's all I wanted to, to say about this very confusing, at least for me, uh, subject. And if there are no questions, I move on. So I hope uh, at least I... This is the way uh, uh, you should understand the, the so, uh, but uh, we will really stick to this set of Maxwell equations, but you, you must know that these are the, the, the macroscopic Maxwell equations because somebody one day could, may ask you. Okay, so So now we can, after this brief detour into notation and uh, 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 yeah. So what uh, uh, should we do that or not? <clears throat> okay, let's leave this as an exercise that we solve together. Uh, so maybe uh, Monday we don't have. So maybe on on uh, on Wednesday we solve together these few problems. Okay, or or you want to wait next Monday? It's up to you. Uh, you want to wait next Monday, meaning next next. Um. Okay, but then let, let's do this because uh, we need it uh, further. So, uh, so we wrote the, the Maxwell equation. So, so let's stick for a second with this, uh, this set with the E, B, and, and D, and H so that we use, uh, since we introduced them, we may as well. So we are really doing the theory in some medium. Okay, so that's the correct. And, and then you may, so I gave you the equations, and uh, through these equations, you, ca you may wonder what happened when you have two, two different medium, media. So one and two. So you have your equations describing the physics of these fields everywhere. And up to now, we, we didn't change anything in the, in the, so this is a problem of boundary conditions, right? And so you may wonder uh, how you, 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 what are the boundary conditions for your fields when the, you cross a, a region of, of one kind or the other kind, and on this surface, you, you have some distribution of charge and current, okay? Is that clear? So I have my Maxwell equations. Up to, no, up to now, I didn't put any boundary conditions. I, I, the sp space was everywhere the same, uniform. But you may cross regions uh, in which uh, space, uh, uh, some property changes, and in particular, you, you, you want to know what happens to your fields when they cross a surface on which there are charges and current, and I call K a, a, a two-dimensional current, so to speak, the current 
uh, on, on a surface. And similarly, sigma is the rho on a surface, the usual, uh, OK? So here you have E1. So this is the uh, region E, B1. And, and since we have introduced these fields, so these four fields completely describe the, the physics of your uh, electromagnetic uh, the, uh, fields. Uh, as we uh, discover, because this is not vacuum, you, 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 need, you need not two fields, but four, or two fields plus those uh, uh, epsilon and mu uh, tensors or, or constants, depending. And, and up here, obviously, you have the same story with the, with the with region two. So how are these components, these fields, connected at the, at the, they must be continuous somehow, or with some discontinuity linked to the, to the charges, and how you connect these components. So this is rather simple to do by, by means of the Maxwell equations. The Maxwell equation tells you exactly how these fields change uh, as you go across uh, uh, this surface. And so they connect uh, the fields uh, sub 1 with the fields components sub, uh, sub 2. Uh, so let's do it first uh, for uh, for uh, so all you have to do is to think of the Maxwell equations in, in, in an integral form. And, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, you see that if you take, f so let's do first uh, uh, the set of Maxwell equations uh, that, they, they, that they have to do with the, f with the divergence. Or uh, remember, the divergence through uh, the Gauss theorem is linked with the, with, the, with the flux, right? So I want to study the flux uh, through this surface. Uh, and to do this, I take a very small cylinder very small because I want to use the differential form of these equations. Well, I mean, I want to use the integral form, but, and, and you see, I take it very small in such a way that uh, I have essentially no, no contribution leaking through the sides of this cylinder, and all the flux goes through uh, this phase to the other one here, and therefore uh, I introduce a, a, a normal vector, or better, a, a vector n that is normal uh, to the surface of this uh, tiny, uh, teeny tiny cylinder. And uh, this is a cylinder, so this has a surface S and a volume V. You, you look sort of, I'm just, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm dealing with this integral, right? Uh, D, uh, S or D A. I wrote it D A, but uh, yeah. You remember this is the flux of this uh, vector through the surface S, okay? And this is linked by the Maxwell, the first Maxwell equation to what? Do you remember? The, the integral of the charge in the volume V, okay? So, in, so this is D3x uh, over the volume V, while the dA by area, A is st stands for area, so I guess, or, or if you want, 2x uh, is over the surface S. So this is first Gauss law, first uh, of the Maxwell equation. So what I, I, so I know this. Now I want to apply this to this situation. And to do that, I take for my volume a, a, a teeny tiny uh, cylinder, OK? This is true for any shape, any chunk of space you want to take. And of course, here I want to take the, the, the one that helps me to get the result. So I want to study how the component of D changes going across this surface, OK? So I, I squeeze this. I take a tiny cylinder. And you see, if I do that, 
I get on this side, this is what? It's just uh, the change, right, D projected along the, the, the normal direction, D2 minus D1. times the, this uh, surface S, I call it, or, or let's call it DA, if I call this A, simpler like this. On the other hand, here I have this volume, I shrink this volume down, so all, all is left is the, 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 this charge density on the surface that I call sigma times the, the size of this surface. So I've done these two integrals by going into an infinitesimal small volume. Therefore, the integral becomes just whatever you wrote here. And then I apply what uh, are, are you following or, or not? <laughs> I, I'm doing the integral the, the, the old way, like Cavalieri did. I mean, you do the integral. How do you do the integral? You, you break up your integration in tiny, you know, dx, right? I'm doing So one of these dx for me here, because this is not just the usual integral, it's a surface integral. So my dx, I take it to be a small cylinder, and I then I shrink it down here, and I make it sufficiently small that I can call dA is just delta A, okay? And then I just compute. And, and this integral tells me that the, the change from D2 to D1 projected along the normal directions is e equal exactly to how much charge you have on the surface that you have included uh, in your cylinder, okay? So that's the first of the boundary conditions, right? Because I can, so this is equal to this, and I can, eliminate the common factor, and I get the change in the electric displacement, D, is proportional to how much surface charge you have there. In other words, if you have zero uh, charge on that surface, the D field goes continuously. And D2 is exactly equal to D1 because we have zero here, okay? How about the B field? What happened to the B field? You have a similar equation, right, for the B field, if you remember, right? That the, the, the flux of the B field around the closed surface, in that case, was not proportional to any charge because there is no magnetic charge, it was just equal to zero. So you can just replace in here the B and here the B, and you get that the B2 minus B1, right, is equal to zero. So in that case, no matter what, even if you have a, a, some current, uh, some, uh, some uh, uh, charges, still the B field, the this uh, magnetic induction goes continuously. So these two are the first uh, two things you must know about boundary conditions, or if you want, about the D and B fields across a boundary. That uh, the D field jumps by an amount proportional to how much charge is there, but this is very, I mean, it, it shouldn't come uh, it's not surprising at all, it's contained in the Maxwell equation. Rather, the magnetic induction goes across uh, without any jump, it's just continuous. It's, this, it's the same field going across. So that was about, remember, the uh, uh, components normal to the surface. How about the other components, the, the components uh, tangential to the surface? Okay, you want a component tangential to the surface, so this I don't want to. So for, to study that, uh, I, I do the other trick. Here I use the, the, the flux diver, diverges, so integral over some. The other trick, that I, I, we know only two tricks, either flux or 
circulation, right? So I guess I have to take a curl, and I take a curl again. I, I start with a curl like this along a, 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 a circuit like this, and then I make this circuit very, very short here and just along the surface, okay? And now I use the other set of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, equations, okay? And, and I start now with H. So I go around this C circuit, right? I do an integral. Now it's not the surface integral, it's a, a circuitation, it's called a, a line integral along this closed loop of H along this loop. Right, and, and I know what this is because I know Maxwell equations that we already wrote. This is equal to a surface integral around, so S. So I guess I should call this S prime because S was this, so this is S prime. <coughs> um, of J plus D D T. N D A. Okay. Now, how about the the well here I, I have a flux, but I make this uh, smaller, smaller, smaller. Okay, and if I assume that this is a finite quantity by shrinking this uh, this circuit, so by shrinking the surface this goes to zero, okay? Because this is a finite quantity. I mean, this does not go to zero because I have this K current on the surface. But the other term is just some field all around that is proportional to, to the surface. So it's constant, the surface shrinks, so this gives no contribution. So I'm only left with the, uh, uh, the, the you see the projection of the current along the surface, and this is what I call K. So here I, you must uh, get this K, okay? So you see, uh, <coughs> uh, I get uh, from, uh, so all is left here is this K that is the current uh, on this surface, as I, I, as, I, as I make this smaller and smaller. And uh, on the other side, I have the two, see, I, I'm shrinking this, so I have the, uh, on the upper side, I have the H2. And then I, when I come down, I have the H on the other side. So in other words, I have H2 uh, minus H1, okay, I have a, a, a well, I, it's like a curl, I have really the n cross this quantity. This must be equal to this current. Okay, so I see here that the, the change in the h component you see, it's a, it's a cross product, so the H, so this is, ortho, so is orthogonal, this N is, is the same N, and then the vector there, so they are, these two are orthogonal, so this is the component orthogonal to both of these two. Similarly, if I do the same for the E field here, you remember that this is just for the E field, you only have the, the, the magnetic induction. You don't have a current there. It's the other Maxwell equation. Really, also the sign must change. But again, by the same argument, because I have a, a, a B field, I have a, a term that is finite, and then I start shrinking the surface. This gives zero contribution. And therefore, in that case, so the N cross uh, the change in electric field, must vanish. So it's a sort of symmetric result. So this, these are the normal components, okay? 
But these, you see, they must be the tangential component because you see they are orthogonal to this, this goes like this, tangent, tangential. So by simply applying Maxwell equations through some clever, cleverly ch chosen surface and loops, you deduce these important relations that uh, are very useful. Uh, we, we will use them uh, when we study some specific systems in the exercises. And essentially, you see that uh, the normal components of these fields uh, for the electric field changes proportionally to the surface char charge. That's uh, rather reasonable. The magnetic field has no surface charges, so it just stays the same. And the tangential are, are sort of the reciprocal in which the, the tangential component of the H field, okay, these components, jumps by an amount proportional to how much current you have on that surface, why the electric field doesn't care about that current, and it just uh, goes through in a continuous way, the tangential, while, while the normal one jumps by amount of the charges, okay? You are not very happy. Well, think about it. Th these are not new equations, you understand? These are, it's not that now we have 10 uh, <laughs> Maxwell equations. It's just the application of the Maxwell equations to this very specific way. So that each time you find this problem, you don't have to go back to, to Maxwell equations, I think. It's rather easy to remember that these are the property of these fields. Uh, and it's easy to remember because uh, it's also reasonable because you know that charges produces, a charge produces an electric field, so this is what uh, you have, some difference in the field inside from the one outside, if you wish, proportion to the amount. And the same, a current, produce, uh, a current produces a, a magnetic field, and so you get uh, an extra, uh, a modification of the H in going from one side to the other. Okay, so... Uh, that said, yeah. Can you make it a bit clear? I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure that I can make it <laughs> more clear. We make them? I'm sorry, I, I'm not sure I, I understand. Ah, why this does not contribute? You, you just, because that's a finite term, right? So you shrink, you shrink, you shrink, uh, you don't get anything. You have a finite term there. Uh, uh, yeah, but this one is a sort of, you see this J goes down, 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 but there really you have, uh, it's like you have a delta function, if you wish, in that integral. So you shrink it, but as you shrink, you get still this current at each point. At each point, you have this current. But this, the, the, the variation of the field is macroscopic. It's, it's larger, and it's proportional to the volume, in a way. So as you shrink the volume, it disappears. Okay. The current is locally there. So you shrink, you shrink, you get that term. OK. So we have just time to introduce the, so now, essentially, we, we uh, well, I, have introduced the Maxwell equations, uh, and so in a way we, we have done everything because uh, <laughs> that's what the, the electro electromagnetism is. It's just the study of the Maxwell equations. But of course, uh, we cannot stop here because otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so from now on, we start doing exercises in a way. So we start ap application of this Maxwell equation. So we, we uh, okay, is that clear? So we have the equations. Well, let's study these equations. Uh, clearly, it will take some time because, as we did for Lagrange equations, you know, to, to work your way through all the possibilities, and, and, and also consider how much more complicated are these equations compared to Lagrange equations, right? Lagrange equations were sort of scalar equations. Uh, they could become very complicated if you had many degrees of freedoms. And how many degrees of freedoms do we have here? 
These are fields in space. So we have an infinite number of degrees of freedom. That's the definition of a field. It's like having an infinite number of harmonic oscillators. So you understand that we are moving to the next step in, in complication. So don't be frustrated if sometimes you, 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 you feel overwhelmed. But before that stage in which you feel overwhelmed, well, we all feel overwhelmed at that stage, let's do a very simple uh, thing, that is, let's study the, the static situation. Let's freeze time and see what happened. And a wonderful thing happened because, remember Maxwell equations, right? But now, everywhere we had a, a partial derivative with respect to time, I take zero because everything is frozen. And you see, the wonderful thing uh, is, so I, now I switch back to E and B because uh, that's what I like. So for the E field, you remember that this, this is whatever it is, but here I had this equal to minus dB dt, but now it's equal to zero. And again, here I had the, 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 the curl of the B, right? It was uh, this uh, one over... Uh, okay, I decided to write it this way. So remember that uh, E naught times mu naught square uh, uh, the, um, is equal to C square. So just to keep you this, uh, uh, I, sometimes I switch. Instead of writing mu, I write this. I don't know why, but it's a good exercise for you. And this was plus, right, D, T, D, E. But now D, T is frozen, so it's zero. And then I have my curl of B that is zero. So you see, very nice. So this is statics. Like in mechanics, we start from, this, from statics. And uh, the nice thing is, see, they split. You can draw a line here. Before, we had this electromagnetic theory. And I went on and on about how nice it was to have the electric field and the magnetic field unified that uh, by varying a magnetic field, you get an electric field, and by varying an electric field, you get a magnetic field. That's very nice, very powerful, but we are not ready yet for that. So let's switch, on, switch off time. And we, again, in this world, the electric field and the magnetic field are completely separate because, you see, these are two sets of equations, and I can study this set without having to worry about that. Or in other words, if I start out with zero B fields, the B fields will remain zero. And if I start out with zero electric field, the B field will, uh, the, the E field will remain zero. Or if I start out with no currents, then I only have an electric field. If I start out with no ele uh, electric charges, then I only have a B field. Right? So the two problems are completely separated. And I can start studying maybe this one first. This is called electrostatics. And this clearly. Where? Equal to zero. Ah, I'm sorry, right. Yeah, I'm a bit tired. <laughs> No, in general, no. I mean, in the, in the Maxwell equations, here I have uh, dB dt, right, minus. So I cannot, you know, I, I, I cannot solve these independently. To solve these, I have to know what b is. So then I have to solve this. And here, too, I have a dE dt, right? So I cannot. So they are coupled. This is nice because it's telling me that these two fields are related. So in the real world, this is what it is. But in these ideal worlds of problem solving, right, of textbooks, you can assume that uh, you switch off, 
you study just statics. In the real world, there is no statics. You cannot freeze anything. Uh, or you can approximate this by screening and all this stuff. But uh, in the, uh, for, for the purpose of studying the subject and, and doing exercises, uh, you can really split the problem. And so then you can study the electrostatics first, and then, or, or vice versa, but traditionally, uh, electrostatics first and magnetostatics. And that's what people in the old day did. In fact, a lot of 18th century, uh, 18, uh, 19th century physics was about these equations, about electrostatics. All those, most of those uh, special functions that uh, you may or may not have studied, I don't remember if you did, like uh, Hyperjobessel, uh, Legendre, we will, hey, unfortunately you will see them again, they come from solving these equations. People wanted to solve these equations, and to do that, one of the techniques, as we will see briefly, is to use this orthogonal polynomial. Okay, so that's a very important problem in the history of physics to study these equations. So, it, it, so that's our next, next uh, 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 the next thing we want to study. But uh, also maybe, so let me, uh, so we, we will start on, on Wednesday. Uh, but I want to conclude by, uh, uh, there is something very nice that if you know, if you, if you, if you refresh your memory about uh, uh, vector calculus, you already know, uh, and is the following. Let's forget, I mean, these are dynamical equations, we see, because they tell you uh, if you have a certain charge, what the electric field is, right? For instance, from this one, we will start by rediscovering Coulomb force, obviously, because it's still there, hidden somewhere. Uh, you know, uh, this is a much uh, cooler way of writing Coulomb force. I mean, we, sort of stupid, or F equal, that's for kids. This is, a, you know, is much sexier. But at the end of the day, this is still in general for, for a fixed charge is, is a Coulomb law. And here is the equivalent. It's called Ampere's law that it tells you how the magnetic field is if you have a current. So it's there. But these two are uh, kind of weird because, you see, they, they are not connected to any charge uh, or current distributions is, is sort of the E field by itself must, so let's stop here and look at these two Maxwell equations, okay, still statics. This is not true in the general setting because, uh, uh, well, this is always true, but uh, this one is not true because you have uh, that extra term. But uh, let's uh, forget about the extra term and let's uh, look at these two fields just by these two equations. And uh, so this is a curl-free field. E is a curl-free free because if you take the curl. So by the way, uh, when I write curl, you, you know what? Uh, uh, the other day, as I was driving here, it just uh, this that crossed my mind that uh, you know what this is. This nabla is uh, the, let's use Cartesian coordinates, right? It's a vector with this component, right? I mean, is that obvious to everybody? Yeah, no, I, I was just, I say, well, maybe. So if I take the divergence, that means I take uh, d, b, x, d, x, right? Plus, okay. Very good. Otherwise, we. So this is a, a field that has vanishing curl. So that's a general field with vanishing curl. And this is a general field, if you want, if you wish, uh, with uh, uh, zero divergence. So it's the divergent less field. So I guess this is, so E is a vector field, right? This equation is telling me, with zero curve, okay? And a given divergence because the divergence is given once you, you give me the, the electric charges. And uh, then if you remember your vector calculus, 
you remember this very nice that if you take a scalar field and you take the gradient of a scalar field, right, this is equal to, to zero. It's always so the curve of a divergent of a scalar field always vanishes. But you can turn this around and because this is always true, that means that the E field, because it's, it's a vector field with zero curl, is always equal to, well, there is a minus because of some convention. So you can always compute your electric field by another field that is called the scalar potential, like uh, with the Lagrangian, right? Scalar, but it's not the same thing. So instead of studying the, the, the E field, that after all is a vector field with three components, you can always study the scalar potential that is a, a scalar field with only one component. And this is not, this in general is not possible for a generic uh, vector field, but it's always possible because of this property if your vector field happens to have vanishing curve. And this is the case for the electric field static, in a static situation. So that's very helpful. And in fact, we will see that uh, these equations can be turned into a basic equations. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the divergence equation of the E field, once you use this to replace E by phi, the, the phi field, sorry, and uh, then this equation is gone. You have used it, OK? And then you are left with the one on the divergence that link, links the divergence of the E field to the charges. But there you replace the scalar potentials. And you will get an equation that is the equation we are going to study. It's called the Poisson equation. How about, so let me, uh, so this was for the electric field. So this is very important. Uh, uh, that's the reason why the uh, electrostatics can be studied in a very systematic manner through through this uh, uh, scalar potential. How about the, the, here, the B field is a vector field, okay, that's for sure. But instead of having vanishing curve, it has, uh, uh, it has uh, uh, zero divergence, so zero. And reciprocal, it has a given curl. So this has a vanishing curl and a given divergence. This is a vanishing divergence, divergence and a, a, a given curl. Now, again, if you remember your, uh, this vector calculus thing, that uh, if you have the divergence of a curl, this, again, is always zero, like there. And this means, right, because of that, that B can always be written as the curl of some vector A. And this is called the vector, see it's a vector, here was a scalar, vector potential. So as for the electrostatic equations, we, we essentially we, we will be studying the scalar potentials. We can do the same for the magnetic field, the, the magnetostatic fields, and study instead of the B field, the vector potential. But you see, the advantage is not as, as, uh, as uh, powerful as in the first case, because here you, you move from a vector field to a scalar potential, so you, you understand that you have some advantage in dealing with that. But here, from a field, you end up with another field. So what's, what's the big gain? And in fact, in magnetostatics, essentially, you stick to the B field in most of the situation. However, these two fields, the, the, the scalar potential and the vector potential, happens to be very important uh, in many applications. And the first of which is that if you want to write the Lagrangian of a, a, of a charged particle in an external electromagnetic field, that remember is essentially the Lorentz force 
that we studied the first day of, of this course. Uh, there, as I said, uh, uh, it's not very easy to introduce the Lagrangian by means of the electric and magnetic fields, but instead it's easy by using the scalar and vector potential. So, in a way, from the point of view of the, of the Lagrangian equations, uh, uh, the, the most fundamental fields are not E and B, but are phi and A, the scalar and vector potentials. Okay? So these potentials are, 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 uh, are interesting. We, we will need them to write the Lagrangian for the interaction of charged particles to the electromagnetic fields. And, 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 uh, and so we want to keep them. At the classical level, they are, very, they are just auxiliary fields. They, they, there is no way to measure these fields. There is no a vector potential uh, sort of, you know, like a GPS or something that tells you how big. A, 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 there is no such a thing as something that measures the scalar potential. So within classical electrodynamics, people uh, thought of them as just auxiliary, auxiliary fields. But I don't know. I don't find this very, after all, as I said, also, you, you don't measure E and B directly. You only measure forces, currents, uh, charges, forces. So it's not clear to me if they have a, a different status, this vector scale. Moreover. Uh, you may have studied this problem in your quantum mechanics class. At the quantum mechanical level, actually these fields have a, uh, they can me be measured in a way because you do have physical effects due to the fact that you have, for instance, a vector potential. Meaning that in regions, regions of space where you have zero magnetic field but a non-vanishing vector potential you have a phase shift in your wave function, okay? This is called the bomb aronov effect. And I think maybe I'll, have you studied this? No? So maybe we'll briefly discuss it sometime because it's important. Because uh, 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 it's important because it argues for the physical meaning of these vector potentials, okay? And of course, at the level of the quantum, uh, uh, the quantization of these fields, this quantization is essentially done on the scalar and vector potential. So they are even more important at that level. But at this level, for our purpose of solving simple exercises in electrostatic and magnetostatic, you can just think them as a trick, that uh, because of these two nice property, that uh, a, a zero core vector field can only be uh, uh, described by a scalar potential, and a divergence-less field can always be described by a vector potential, we move to these new quantities and study the equations for, for those, okay? So next time we, we, we will do exactly that. We, we, we take this scalar potential and plug in into, so you need to know what the divergence, right, uh, the divergence of a gradient is, and that is going to be the other Maxwell equations that I raised. So the divergence of a gradient is going to be proportional to the electric charge, and that will be our equations, and then we will spend, uh, I guess, a week solving that equation that, as I said, is called Poisson equation. Okay, I'll stop here. Questions?